So, okay. bonjour Ben. <laughs> bonjour Ben. Um, may I ask you to introduce yourself as a um, director and where you where you are right now? My name is uh, Ben Lawrence, and I'm the director of the documentary film Ithaca about Julian Assange and his fight for freedom. And the story is told through his family. And I'm in Sydney, Australia at the moment. So thank you for having me. So to start with the beginning, how did um, do you remember the first time you heard about Julian Assange or WikiLeaks? Yeah, look, like a lot of people, I first heard of WikiLeaks when they released the collateral murder video. Um, so that was my first time I became aware of them. And that was such a big event around the world. But in Australia, to have an Australian um, have published that material and be at the core of the, this organisation that I hadn't heard of, WikiLeaks, it was really fascinating to me. And Julian and I are a similar age. So it was someone who was doing an incredible thing somewhere in the world and um it also you know that that period in the war uh in iraq and afghanistan as well um that was something that fascinated me because even going back to iraq war one um i was of an age when there were a lot of young men from australia going and you know all this feeling of war was something that was unfamiliar to my generation and all the protests that were occurring around that time but so when that video came out it was like a flash of a uh, truth Uh, it was like one of those uh, famous images from the Vietnam War where everyone saw the truth, true face of war. And it was something of well, I felt like my generation that was really important. And, um, you know, it really shook the world in that way. That was my first my first time that I'd heard of WikiLeaks. And from that moment, I started to read about them and pay attention. Okay. And um, at this moment, did you already imagine that one day you will do a, a movie about uh, Julian Assange? No, I could never imagine. I mean, I'd followed uh, WikiLeaks' story and the story, Julian's story, through the newspapers and the press uh, media. And um, when Gabriel contacted me, it was out of the blue. We, we I didn't hadn't met him before. I wasn't aware of Gabriel. I was aware of Julian uh, being arrested in London uh, in 2019. Um, but I had lost track of the story because as we saw with a lot of things around WikiLeaks, it was very much suppressed and we only heard small things about what was going on in the embassy. Um, but yeah, I look, it was a, a, an amazing opportunity. And I just, as soon as I spoke to Gabriel, I wanted to be part of it. So it was uh, something that came at the right time from the right person. And um, I felt an enormous responsibility Uh, because it was an opportunity to be invited into a family. You know, any opportunity like that, because it's a very intimate space when you're with a family, but when you're with a family who is going so through something uh, like a crisis, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of trust there. And then there was, so there was the weight of the family story, and then there's the weight of Julian's story, which is global. So I felt a double responsibility just to do my best, um, and a very complicated story, so I had to really understand uh, a, a lot more than I had really understood before. So uh, in that respect, it was uh, life changing for me. I, I wanted to ask you, how did this adventure start? So it's Gabriel who contacted you and proposed uh, the movie. Yeah, that's right. So in uh, about July, August 2020, uh, Gabriel called me and um, said that there he was had this idea for a documentary you know gabriel's a filmmaker he's a producer um and he he said that he wanted to make a documentary about julian but to tell that story through their father john and i just thought that was a wonderful idea um i thought that uh whatever whatever material that we film would be interesting i hadn't met john by that point and he was coming through sydney um that month and so we went and had dinner and I was just introduced to this character that we all know who uh, get a sense of who John is in the film um, and so the combination of having met John and then the understanding of Julian and then Gabriel as a as a as a producer but also as a person of, of high integrity and character it really um, created a, a project a film a story a life experience that I wanted to be part of And we talked about what sort of film we <clears throat> what sort of film we wanted to make, 
And it was very similar. It was intimate. It was about a family. It was about a father. Um, and so we, we moved forward with that. And we, we went into this unknown period, which, you know, at the time it was COVID. London was in lockdown. Australia was in lockdown. There were all these other complications around trying to make a film at that time. Um, and within a month, I was on a plane to London and um, living with John and in a big house in London and uh, our, our cameraman who I had never met, Danish cinematographer, Niels Ladafoda. So we, we, we were this little team, this little group in a house in lockdown. And um, we started traveling each day in the taxi to the court um, to follow John. And uh, we slowly around meals, uh, which you see in the film, uh, these interviews at, the, at our meal table uh, with John and sitting in the taxi, um, we all got to know each other. And part of that getting to know each other is in the film um, because at times it's abrasive, at times it's, uh, you know, you get to see John's charm, at times you get to see his his temper or his uh, impatience with me. Um, but I wanted also to understand Julian or understand a son through his father you know, and so I don't think it explains everything about Julian, but I, I think it explains something. So it's a little piece of Julian's story that we may not have seen before. So in all the canon of artwork and stories and films and books about Julian and WikiLeaks, I think Ithaca sits as a unique space that tells something of the man at the centre of it, but by the people who love him uh, and are surround him. But Julian's absent in the film. So it's a strange feeling that replicates how the family feels because he's absent but it also creates this intimacy because you you are trying to reach julian through these people as we all are but as they are also at the same time trying to save him but there's a lot going on that we were trying to balance and then the geopolitics and the the intrigue and the, the spying and and, and uh, the court case itself so um, all of that was in balance when we were trying to create the story and it works pretty well. Um, what is very impressive, it's uh, this, uh, this intrication uh, in between intimacy and political, because it's such a political subject. It's a huge thing and concerns all the planet. And, uh, and you are close, the heart of a man, the heart of a woman, the children, and even you, we can feel you uh, uh, of course, when when you try to 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 talk about uh, Julian with the father and how it can be tricky or uncomfortable at the beginning, and to find your place, you know, in this uh, dimension, but it works really pretty well. Um, and I really wonder how. Um, it, I, I guess maybe it has been very hard to shoot and very long. To find your place uh so maybe we can talk about it as a director as a director your place how to how was it in one part making a film like that i don't want to go in uh, i want to go in knowing as much as the audience i guess in some way so you you experience a little bit of of uh my naivety you experience a little bit of me trying to understand a story and that is in the story. So it kind of brings the audience along. And I also didn't try to assume that the audience knew a huge amount. So there's a little bit of a, uh, a threshold, a portal into the story, I hope, um, by me <laughs> going on the same journey. So there's a, there's a, rep, a, a mirror there. Um, so as a director, I try and do that. I, I enjoy films that, that take me in and uh, kind of guide me into it, particularly complicated films like I thought Ithaca would be. The other thing I, I was very much aware of is that Julian and the story of WikiLeaks has been so uh, become so divisive that there would be some reluctance to try and engage. And I wanted to uh, bring those people along by telling a story about a family, a universal story about a family, and give them something new and allow them to get to know the person and the people around him. So that was a, an approach that I had in mind as well. 
Okay, so okay. sorry, it, it, it cut when you were talking about uh, the approach you had in your um, mind, kind of. Um, yeah, was it? There was a moment where I mentioned that Julian WikiLeaks was divisive, and that was probably my second point. That we, yeah, I can pick it up from there. So, I, I, you know, I was very aware that WikiLeaks and Julian was a divisive issue, and had become that. And you know, the the point of telling the film and creating the film was to counter that story, and give people a point of view from the family that hadn't been told before. So, I wanted to create a story that was accessible, that was intimate, that was about you know, family, but I also, I knew I'd have three months, at least in the first filming phase, to um, spend time with the family who were under a lot of stress. And so the approach was just to do cinema verite, is just to follow them and not engage too much. And it wasn't for a little while until we started to do interviews that I, that I really felt comfortable that I could do interviews with John that were more direct. But over a period of the first few weeks, we got to know John through the through the interviews that he was doing with the press. So the press would always ask, how is Julian? What's going on in the court case? So we were understanding, but I was filming him from a distance. And similarly, when John was talking to Stella, that we could just be there for those conversations or that uh, John was on the phone to Julian, we could just feel like we're just in the room. And that creates, I think, a real tension. It creates a very immediacy and a present tense um, so you feel like you're spending time with these people as their life is unfolding so it has a gentleness to it which i really liked um, but i should mention about stella when i started we weren't aware that she, whether or not she was going to be in the film because only in the preceding six months had she kind of gone public uh, as being julian's partner of having had children together and that was only really her hand was forced during the court proceedings when the court kind of refused to uh, conceal, protect her identity and protect the identity of the children. Um, so it was really her decision and she took control of that to step into the public eye. Um, and so when I met her, we have, were filming with John and I think it wasn't necessarily uh, always going to be the case that she was going to be in the film, but it very naturally happened. She started joining us in the taxi, spending time together. And what was really beautiful is that you get these two sides of the family. And and I think the love of a partner and the love with a parent are very different loves. So you get these very different perspectives on Julian as a person as well through them and the way they interact with him on the phone and talk about him. Um, so I love the exploration of that as well. And it just heightened the idea of uh, these two people together who are very different. Um, but, you know, obviously you're joined by the love of Julian and also they're advocates, they're activists. Um, and that was something that I think was in, in, a, in a lot of ways it was new to them. You know, fronting the press, um, having to speak on Julian's behalf in, sometimes. I mean, Jewel, Stella has this dual role of legal team, but also partner and, and mother of his kids and all of that. So a wife now, um, they weren't married at that point. But... Um, so you get all these perspectives, and I and I really love that, and it gave a richness to the film, um, and it also gave a very different perspective to how the, the audience understands uh, Julian and the world of uh, advocacy uh, for trying to free a political prisoner, speak for freedom of press, um, and you know it just brought this family together. So I witnessed all of that, and I and you know I just wanted to capture it. But a lot of the time, it was really stressful for me. And the I had a camera and the cinematographer had a camera and we would just sit in the room with them. We would sit in the taxi together. And you, a lot of the time, if you've done that sort of filming before, you just feel like you don't want to be there because you're intruding. And when you feel like that, I think they're the best moments. You know, the, the worse it gets, the, the, the more you want to shrink down and just not be there, but you want the camera to keep rolling. So... It was a really uh, uh, trying to show respect for what's going on and trying to capture the film. And ultimately, I hoped and I knew that this film was going to be a vehicle to help them in their fight because it was going to show something that they were trying to communicate to the world. And I think if we just filmed them like we did, we were going to get to that point. And then in the end, we came home with, I'm going to say, two, 
do 150 days of filming with two cameras. So, you know, it was months of footage to go through. And then it became a process of one year almost of editing, of shaping, filming more. We kept filming while we were editing. The story continues as it does to this day. So it was, it was like looking at the world through a telescope. You know, you just see that moment and it's that slice. And if that slice is meaningful enough, it will explain so much. But um, I think we captured a lot of moments to hang the film on, of those intimate moments. And what hangs on them is the, you know, the explanation of the court case or the archive news material. Or sometimes it's an interview with someone else, like a podcaster with John. Uh, so, yeah, it's the combination of all of that that I think creates this, I think, a really interesting film and, and a kind of a unique experience for me because I didn't know how it was going to end, how we were going to put it all together. It, it, you just trust that it's going to be okay making it. It works so well. Yesterday uh, we had a, a screening with uh, journalists and audience and uh, a debate after that. And one of the first person who talks said that no one can be indifferent to this movie. Uh, mm. And that's so true. Even if you don't know Julian Assange and uh, you, you, you can feel it. And uh, in between uh, Stella and John, Stella and the children and John, Julian is here, you know, he there's something that appears. And as you said, only through love. And how the, the, the election of Joe Biden, the hope that it creates, and how it happened in a family, you know, big events, and how it's going on in a family in another room or in a family house, and in all these kind of hopes and the reality. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a movie very rich, very necessary. And mm -hmm. what I was wondering is how did the audience respond First in Australia and in US. Um, look, in Australia, it's been quite incredible. I, th I think it has really turned uh, the tide. Uh, I think the timing of the release in Australia um, and the support that it allowed people to show. It, it, it's almost like the film gave permission to people to congregate and discuss and uh stake their position because they hadn't for so many years. I think that the overwhelming uh, negative press that had been targeted on WikiLeaks and Julian, I think the ongoing court case, um, the film placed itself for people who had been silent to no longer be silent. And that's what we saw. And we had an election uh just after the film was released. So the timing of it allowed the film to become a political issue, allowed the press, who were quietly supportive in their pockets, to ask the question of the prime, minister, prime ministerial candidates where they stood on Julian Assange. It also allowed those candidates who were in marginal seats to competitively stand behind Julian or not. And it tested the Australian people in response to say, this is now an issue for the electorate, for the nation to discuss. And just by discussing it, it allows others to come in for support. So it kind of just created this environment where people felt safe to speak their mind. And in that way, um, I think the film worked really well in Australia. Um, I think in America, it, you know, it's interesting. It's a different issue in America. In Australia, in some ways, there's a core value of fairness that the film resonates about. It's something that the Prime Minister in Australia has taken this position of, this isn't fair. It's not about free press. It, in the way he speaks about it, it's not about free press. It's not about uh, freedom of journalist. It's about being fair. And this idea of fairness is not a kind of an Australian thing that um, has kind of seeped into our culture. I don't think it's exclusive to Australia. It exists everywhere. For some reason, Australians uh, respond to that word. And so that has been a big issue in Australia around uh, the Prime Minister says, enough is enough. This should end. Julian's uh, treatment has gone on long enough and nothing is served by his 
the continuation of this prosecution. So he says enough is enough. In America, it's, it's very much a free press issue. I think that's what resonates in America. You know, in, in that way, that country uh, identifies with the, their First Amendment being the freedom of the press. Everything is built on that. So you can really tell Julian's story and the, the how the, the justice has not been served and the threat to journalism as well uh, in, in to America in those terms. And Gabriel and John did 50 screenings in America, and I think that's what really resonated. And I can see a similar thing happening there where they're building they're building an alliance, they're building a coalition, but Australia is a little bit ahead. The other thing is Julian's Australian too, citizen, and should he return home, he'll return home to Australia. And um, so I think that um, Australia was a good testing ground for the release in other places. And it's always been a little bit unique depending on what speaks, what aspect of the story speaks to that country. Uh, so I think it's been a wonderful tool for the the understanding of this issue and Julian. In Great Britain, how uh, how did uh, it work? It already has been released out there? Yeah, it was on ITV in the UK. And um, I didn't get a great sense of the reaction there, but there was a short um, theatrical release as well. But it was... I don't know. It felt like one of the hardest places to really kind of crack, uh, even though there's a lot of on the ground support. Um, I felt it was difficult there. I mean, the support in Europe is like nowhere else. Um, having said that, Latin America, South America is really supportive. And, and we've had screenings a lot in Argentina and Brazil and, and uh, you know, further north in Mexico as well. So that, that that's that's been fantastic. But um UK, I don't know. It was hard to get a sense of what really, how, how the audience felt uh, about the film there. But, you know, in Australia, it's been a groundswell. It's been a, you, you've noticed a lot more press, a lot more support, and it's gone right up to the Prime Minister. So that's been the best reaction that I've seen. Uh, the, uh, the English, the British, I think, are more reluctant to kind of let this issue go and, um, It's uh, it's a real shame because I think it's an opportunity for them to flex their be a more sovereign nation, you know. And I think that's probably another issue that's at play a little bit. Um, but a mo uh, you know, my response of people coming up to me after the film is always one of they're surprised how emotional it is. They're surprised what it does to them. And it, it surprises them how much it makes them think about their own family and what they may do in that same situation. So all of those uh, are, are really fantastic. And then you start to have a discussion about um, Julian and WikiLeaks. So it just opens this um, emotional uh, conversation. It's not about politics. It's not about press. It's not about um, justice so much. Although you get to those points, but you get to them through this emotion. And that's where I think people are more available and more um, open to talk about all these issues because otherwise, you know, we're too divided to even begin with those subjects. We need to begin with the human scale. And I think that's what the film does. It's really nice that you let the stories for children, um, Stella and the, and, the, and the boys, Julian's around, and John, let's say that he never watched interviews. But he keeps update about children's story to be uh, to be able to communicate to Seren. And I love this kind of parable, this kind of things that you let. Uh, and that's all. and are you familiar with documentary movie? Did you already make some or? I have made one feature documentary previous, and I have done other uh, like a television type uh, documentary news format type things. Um, so, yeah, I, it was a format that I, I have always loved and I have made a couple. Um, so I felt prepared for this film. Um, but what didn't prepare me, uh, what I wasn't prepared for is the, how much it changed me. I mean, I was supportive of Julian and WikiLeaks uh, before, but now it has opened my eyes to uh, how the media works, uh, the dynamic uh, shift that is going on since the internet has been born, um, how Julian's story has been uh, shaped 
and the powers that are kind of affect that. So, you know, my, my insight into that has been really interesting. You know, that's that's where my new area of interest really lies. So that's and and Gabriel and I are trying to make more films about this subject matter uh, while he's advocating for Julian. So. You know, it's something that is, uh, I think, is a lifelong interest now and uh, something that, you know, I have a deeper understanding of. Mm, that was a question that I wanted to ask you. How did it change you as a man and as a mm. director? Um, because um, so it means that documentary can change the world or people by opening new windows. So after that, uh, I was thinking that maybe it's complicated to 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 do some movies, um, um, I don't know, not so political or... So, because are you an activist before that? Are you...? Oh, look, I, th I think so. You know, I think we all are. You know, it's funny, making the film, the thing that struck me the most powerfully um, were the activists that were outside the courthouse. And they were the same ones who were outside the embassy when Julian was there. And, um, you know, I spent, uh, you know, a, a month sitting on the sidewalk, <laughs> waiting outside the, the, the old Bailey in London. And John would come out during the break and we would, you know, wait outside for him. And the time that I spent out there, I got to know the activists, you know, one by one, we would talk what this, ask them about their lives. And every single one of them had a moment where they themselves or a family member had been oppressed, had been affected by state power, uh, had been affected by corruption, and some in really horrific and tragic ways. And if it wasn't them themselves who had been affected, it was their parents. And they were all like John. I mean, John is so much more closer to the activists than he is to the legal team. You know, he's this kind of grassroots person who has been activated by his son's oppression and the oppression of his son. And, you know, and so I started to really um, fall in love with these people, you know, and their stories. And, you know, I would love to make a documentary about that. But the one question that really sat with me is how do they keep going? And, and once you're activated in life, I think you just keep going because it's a a burning desire within you to kind of uh, seek justice for yourself, um, help others who are oppressed. And it's this ongoing cycle. So, you know, when I see a protest on the street, I just think it's amazing because it's a, it's a representation of a larger population. But the people who are on the street standing in the cold, you know, there's a hundred other people at home who, who aren't going to make it out on the street, but support them. So, you know, uh, it's that that for me this film activated me in that way i think but it was there already you know i think it's in all of us but we just need that spark you know and it's that personal spark it's someone affected you get affected by it your loved one gets affected by it so um that's who we see on the street in protest you know people who have an inner burning desire to change things and uh, because they've seen what happens when we're not vigilant and uh it's hope. It, they, they keep kind of hope alive as well. For John, I think John draws a lot of energy from the activists. You know, everywhere he goes, he will find a vigil somewhere in Paris and Latin America and, you know, wherever he goes in Australia, he'll always turn up. There's a vigil every Friday night in Sydney. And he, if he's in Sydney, he'll go and spend that hour or two with them. Um, and he'll speak and he'll spend time with everyone. And uh, I think he really, uh, you know, has a strong bond with them and they, they love him. So because they can see in him, there's the shared fight, which is great. So yeah, that was a really surprising aspect for me. And, uh, and it's a political act to, to have accept to make this movie, because as you said, it's a Cliven subject. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, so now you are, you know, uh, you too, you are involved. On a personal level, on a, as a cinematographer, as, uh, as a director, and it's something. It's not especially easy to make it. I guess it's right for you, but it's political. It's it's more than political. 
It is. You you step into it. You 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 step in across the line, and you say, "This is what I believe," and uh, you say to the world, "This is why I believe it." And um, you know, sometimes you bring people along, and sometimes people don't agree with you. But the 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 film is there. The film is there to present the ideas of of uh, why John and Stella feel this way is clear. You know. But why we all should share their fight is in the film, and so uh, I think it explains it in a way which is uh, compassionate, but also uh, presents it why it's important and why it should should be important to people as well. And I think it presents it in a way that is um, accessible. You know, uh, a lot of the time I think it's hard to step into certain. Um, fights because you know you get pushed away by the the advocacy is sometimes too overwhelming you feel like straight away you're the opposition but you want it you're curious you know and so i think this film is aware that if you are curious about this issue if you're curious about why this is so important is that this film is kind of made for you you know i think uh, the some people wanted the film to be stronger some people wanted the film to be more angry some people wanted the film to be uh you, you know present the case in more direct terms but that is not john's style and i think it 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 reflects his character mostly and i think it also uh is it presents it in a way in which you can enter it you know um and so that's what i wanted to wanted to do and the other thing i want to talk about is the title because the title is you know about returning home but it is also about what i think the meaning of hope is in the what are the core question that I wanted to always ask John and Julian is how, and the activists, I should say, is how do you keep going? You know, when it's cold in the morning and you don't want to get up, uh, you've got pressures of everyday life of making a living and etc. cetera. And uh, how do you keep going? You know, John's getting old now. Um, and it is this idea of the journey and um and you know i think i understood that the activists that 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 journey without having doing done what they're doing life wouldn't be worth living because the alternative of not stepping in of not taking action means that kind of you know live life to the fullest so ethica kind of speaks to me in all of those ways did you watch the other about uh, julian assange so hacking justice um... I haven't seen I haven't seen Hacking Justice. Um, I've seen Risk, um, and I've seen the the drama with Benedict Cumberbatch that they did about WikiLeaks oh, yeah. and Julian, the the, the uh, American film. Um, and I've read a couple of books. So that's kind and the news. I just consume the news. Um, But it was, I mean, Neil's uh, our cinematographer. He was a real, um, you know, he's been kind of involved and in, in and around uh, Julian and his work for many years, and the work of whistleblowers and the work of free press. And he's made other films about similar subject matter. So he was, he was, and he he kind of gave me the the landscape uh, of who was who and and uh, what was going on within the law and all that sort of stuff and who to follow on Twitter. And so he was, he was fantastic. So I felt like he was a real co-director in that way um, and creatively, but also, you know, just spiritually, but also with the, the information that was required. Um, but those other films, I think uh, it sits within all of those others, you know, you can almost have a, a festival of those to kind of see them all together and between them you could make sense of possibly what is going on um some are better than others you know i think risk did a lot of damage for uh to to julian um and uh you know that in of itself um along with a lot of press during that period i think is starting to be undone is starting to be unwound and reflected on And uh, I think the press, I've seen a huge change in the press of starting to kind of rise up and be more supportive. So that's probably the biggest change that I've seen in the last three years of being, you know, heavily involved. So it, it means uh, that uh, at the end, documentaries, 
can really influence on the opinion of the audience. And uh, did you already watch a movie or a documentary that changed your life or your perspective before this one <laughs> you made? Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, there's an doc old documentary called The Salesman. It's an American black and white documentary about Bible. They sell Bible. They go to door to door and they sell Bibles. Yeah, beautiful. And there's there's scenes in it where you have the salesman sitting in the lounge room with the uh, wife in the, the housewife in the in the home, and he's selling Bibles to her. And when I watched that film, I was very young, and I thought to myself, how did they make that? It was the one question that I wanted to work out: is how did they get a camera in there, and why aren't they reacting to the camera, and why are they just talking to each other? What were the conversations that were had before to get into that space? Um, and so that question has stayed with me. <laughs> and I think that's what I'm always trying to work out is how do you get into that space, that intimate space where, you know, you're, you're, you're in a home, uh, you're in a taxi or you're in a, in, a, in a workplace that feels like you shouldn't be there and you're showing the world through your film this moment. Um, so you know that documentary opened that up but you know more recent documentaries like the act of killing uh, about uh, indonesia uh, i mean that was amazing uh, i think that changed documentary in the contemporary sense the form uh like i hadn't seen in a long time so that that was that was really impressive to me i was i didn't think until i saw that i didn't know that that was even possible you know, so and I think that's had the same effect on a lot of filmmakers, uh, that film. Uh, I was thinking about the act of killing because it really changed the history. Uh, as before that, uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a subject. It wasn't allowed to talk about the genocide in Indonesia. And this is exactly the kind of documentary that can change history, can change the perspective of um, of um, something hidden, uh, something forgotten. Yeah, amazing. I felt the same way, and I felt like it's uh, it's given an opportunity for a lot of other countries to talk about their responsibility, like Australia, you know, involvement in that genocide as well, you know, and the, a whole bunch of other things. But, you know, the power of documentary to do that and to open up those discussions, I think, is really encouraging that that uh, still happens and to talk about the things that are hidden or taboo, um, and to shift the narrative, and I think that's what we we're trying to do with Ithaca, is, is slowly shift of this narrative. And, and, and that's really important because as a document in history, if all we look back and we see this one version, we accept that. But if there's this one little film that says something different, like how do we explain that? You know, so that counter narrative is really important. Um, and so I think that Ithaca and Hacking Justice uh, you know, are films that we would look back on and see these moments that run counter to a general narrative, and we can slowly start to see how over time that changes. And I think that, uh, you know, when you look like uh, someone like Daniel Ellsberg with the Pentagon Papers, he went through a similar persecution. Mm. And, um, you know, now he was regarded as a hero uh, in America. And so... Over time, you know, I feel like that slow bend uh, changes and it's these little moments that we can see, I think. And uh, in the movie, uh, it's, John says that he prefers, a, um, yeah, I don't know if it's exactly like this, but, you know, he mentioned the difficulty, uh, the di difficulty of a destiny, destiny, destiny. Uh, he prefers a Van Nisi narrative, and I was wondering for you with that in during the editing, it had it must have been really something. And you mentioned two hundred hours, no, uh, uh, yeah, two two hundred days, yeah, two hundred days, yeah, and yeah. Uh, one year of editing, one year, and it's a, one year of editing for two hundred days. Good job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah no, like really. But to write it during the editing, uh, you were with Gabriel, you were with your Niels. How did you make it? 
I work with my editor, Karen Johnson, who I've worked with before, and um, she's a wonderful master storyteller. And she, you know, I come home with the footage and I show her and we talk about it and she dives in and we pull things out and we argue and we, you know, and uh, we try things. I mean, when we first sat down, we looked at John as a character and a story and everything that I'd filmed that was just focused in on him. And it seems natural now that the film's going to be about him. But, you know, I remember watching an early edit and thinking, and Karen said to me, can we watch John for two hours or an hour and a half? And we're like, we we weren't sure. We we didn't know. We didn't know. I guess maybe we didn't have confidence in something. It was new to us. I had just come back. I hadn't watched anything. And um, so there's all of those discoveries that you have, the conversations that you have to have with yourself about the story. Um, and in some ways, the decisions are made for you because, you know, you haven't filmed other things. We had done a lot of other interviews. You know, I had filmed all the activists on the street. I had filmed other people uh, through Europe. Um, and uh, they didn't, they weren't in the film, you know. So it all focused in on John and Stella. And because of that, it becomes more concentrated and you, you, they become the characters. And again, it seems like, of course, you know, that's going to happen now. But at the time when you're editing and you have, you know, a million options, um, you wonder how much more you need to help the story. But in the end, we trusted that that was going to be the thing. John's phrase about the difficulty of destiny, um, you know, I thought a lot about that. When I, when I first heard it, I thought, oh, that's wonderful. If we put that at the start of the film, it means we can do anything later on. You know, it doesn't matter what happens. It kind of was a license to say we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know what the end of the film was going to be. In some ways, we didn't know because we didn't know what the outcome of the court case was going to be. Um, and then the bail as well, the app bail application. So we were all hanging on uh, the idea that it would be a different outcome, that Julian might get bail or some. So you kind of prepared for all these different eventuations. But what John's phrase did is it said that at that point, when we were editing and storytelling, we can do anything. It doesn't matter what the end is because the end is the destiny. And somehow what occurred to me was in thinking about that phrase, it's so much more deeper than that. Because what it says is that you maintain hope by understanding what happens is destiny. Because if you have a narrative in mind and you have expectation, that is what erodes hope. You think something's going to happen, you hang on to it. You have a narrative about the world that this is who you are and this is what will happen. And when those things rarely fall that way, your hope is diminished. And when John says the difficulty of destiny, it is more about acceptance and allowing the world events to occur. And I think that what he was talking about is how he keeps his strength. And it's a very... Um, poetic way of looking at the world in some ways it just allows the beauty of the world to unfold but John plays a long game and he knows that he's in the fight until he can't fight anymore or he has the outcome that he wants um, so thinking that tomorrow is going to be a good day it, it's exhausting to him he just turns up and he does what he needs to do and He's probably the most present person I think I've ever met. So when you're with him, when he's in that moment, that is all that is happening. He's there with you. And it's, I think it's part of his, he talks about his uh, autism-like behavior. You know, he's very focused. He's very observational with people. And uh, he engages with uh, a love of life as well. Uh, and so all of these things I take out of the experience of making the film but also I hope that they're in the film, particularly in the final moment where we're with John and we're trying to work out how is this film going to end? And, uh, you know, I always had in mind that John was just going to get on another plane and fly on and keep fighting, you know, because that's what happened. And that's what happens till today. But what I've seen is that they've built something, 
you know they build a house like john used to build when he was a builder you know they build the foundation and they collect people in and they build the frame and the walls and the windows and slowly they're going to build something and everyone will come and join them um but it's a big house and it's a slow process and i think over time you can see now what they've been able to do and they're bringing everyone into this kind of uh this fight so uh you know i wish i could keep filming and just show that it continues on and that there's a happy outcome but you know life is not like that sometimes but the fight the fight is the important thing because it gives the gives meaning to life you know and i think a lot of people are searching for that you know what's a, why don't i have meaning but as soon as you start to take a position there's meaning and uh that's uh that's a great thing to discover we can't spoil the end of the movie but the last no. sentence the this um subtlety of uh, using uh this is so cinematographic for me this kind of end and uh with in one sentence which is an echo to another one and uh and for me at the end it just ends on this idea of transmission or, or this way to connect with in nearly in the non-visible even if it's a movie well, and uh so yeah it's 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 really cinematographic i mean it's uh in the reality is more than powerful but for cinema it brings something um yeah which makes really sense in fact I really like the ending and it, it's funny, John would talk about this thing. Uh, I hadn't heard the word before, but he would say egregore, the egregore, which is this egregore. I'll have to look up the definition, but it is this thing that exists that sweeps through uh, civilizations and people and countries. And it is a, a kind of a sweeping idea of a revolution or a sweeping idea of a belief or because we would talk about things and and I would say John how did this happen and he would say it's the egregore you know and and if we sweep along with this it will and so that that connection that you feel at the end of the film that sends your mind racing back into the story um uh, has has an essence of that has a feeling of that so uh I like that connectedness you know the parents share with their children that we share with each other uh all of that so yeah i'm glad that you feel that way about the end because I, yeah I, re i really like it too and it's an emotional moment too that is a it just continues on continues on life crops on uh, oh no yeah just one minute because i think it's going to cut on the music the music yes. is beautiful it's uh yeah <laughs> Yeah, just Brian Eno is a supporter and has been of Julian for a long time. And uh, Gabriel spoke to him early on and said he was making the film and uh, asked if Brian would give us some music or compose some music or could we license his music, some way in which he could be part of the film. And um, he uh, came back and he said, I'd like to uh, score composed for the whole film and i said wonderful you know what what do we do now how do we how do we work together and because you know uh I, i don't i think i never got to meet him but we would have a zoom like this but the first thing that happened is that he just sent a whole bunch of music that he had composed without watching anything wow and it there were two very different groups of music and um one we used in the film the other one i couldn't find a place for and so it it was straight away we used that and then we scored the whole film with that and so you get this theme and each each track uh had uh had this, this similar similar theme but there was one track that brian said i only want this to be uh on the end of the movie this is a very special track and um when uh we spoke to him later on when we needed some more music uh 
he said, which track is it? And I said, there's the one at the end. We need more of that and we need a more dimensional shape so we can put it in the film. And so when he said this is a special track, you could you can hear it. You know, it's very different from the others. It has something, a quality about it that's um, just sits on the end of the film really well. But it's also a version of it is in the in the film. But yeah, we only had two conversations. I don't think he ever watched anything. And there was this beautiful marriage that they just worked together. So uh, I just trusted that it was going to work, and it did. And uh, I, yeah, I'm really happy with the music too. It's a it was a good lesson in how to work with a, a composer. But um, it was an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think it really helps the film too. But uh, yeah, uh, I'm glad you like it. Merci Ben. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, good to uh, good to chat. Very good questions. Thank you. Great conversation. So good luck, and let me know. There you go. Thank you.